So my name is Susan Sharp. I'm coming to you from Halifax, Nova Scotia. So completely the other side of the country today. Um, and I'm from an organization called Digital Moment. So we are a charity based in Montreal and we do workshops on computer coding, also artificial intelligence all across Canada in French as well as in English. Today, I have a workshop based around artificial intelligence. Um, so this is both kind of an introduction to some of the basics of artificial intelligence, some of the terms that are useful to know, and also talking about um, what, uh, what possible concerns there are around artificial intelligence, and a few of those that are of particular interest to teachers. Um, so, uh, I do have, uh, some slides that you can look at. I'll share the link for those that now I'll also do that at the end of, uh, our session today. Um, I do also want to say that, uh, we have a survey. So if you can take some time to fill out the survey at the very end of the session, that is very useful for us. We really appreciate your feedback and the survey is how we can, show the good work we're doing and continue to do it. Um, so a little bit about me to start off with. Um, I have a university degree in biochemistry. I've taught a lot of different things, including coding, math, science, violin, a little bit all over the place. Um, I'm in Halifax and I grew up here and I've been with Kids Coach and S since 2019. So I started off as an instructor so I would do workshops around in classrooms, started off in person, then, then the pandemic was a lot of virtual stuff. Uh, we do a lot of workshops with the microbit, which is this cool little thing here. Um, and now I manage our education programs. So that's my introduction on me. What we're going to talk about today is uh, talk about some concepts related to AI, so you can have a basic understanding. Um, we're, we're going to explore some hands-on approaches to AI. We're going to consider the impact of the technology, understand some risks, and um, talk about critical judgment related to AI. So before we jump into all of those things, I want to start with a question for you. What do you know about artificial intelligence? So what comes to mind when I say those words? This can just be kind of like word association, anything you can think of, and you can feel free to put those thoughts in the chat. So some interesting words so far, talking about how it's inescapable that students and teachers are already using it. Um, talking about chat GPT, which could have an issue of plagiarism and that it can be a research tool and it's the future. So that vague idea, yes, I agree. It's the future, which is both exciting and scary. Um, and Prompt engineering is a cool idea as well. So all those are definitely parts of um, what artificial intelligence is. Um, I would say that what we're talking about and what's in the news a lot recently is things like chat GPT, prompt engineering, that kind of stuff. That is the newest kind of vanguard of artificial intelligence, but there are also a lot of systems that use some of the same principles that were already in use in our society and we're kind of a little bit more hidden. So we'll also talk about that a bit today. So we get to do a lot of workshops with students and we ask this question to students a lot. What do you think of when I say AI? And here are some of the things that they think of. They think of video games. Um, they think of uh, things like Alexa and Siri that are able to answer questions. 
Um, they uh, think of chat GPT like we did. Um, things like face filters, various things on their phones, also robots and the Terminator. So good to know that the Terminator is still a cultural reference that most people get. Um, but that's also getting at that d idea of scary. So we definitely get the sense that artificial intelligence is something that's out there, that's being talked a lot about, um, but people don't necessarily understand what exactly is artificial intelligence, what are some examples of it, and how we can interact it with it in a way that is ethical and makes sense for us. So that brings us to the idea of digital citizenship. So this is the idea that with all the new digital technologies that are out there, so things like the internet, which makes us much more connected, and this new layer on the internet that we have now of artificial intelligence, is that we want to be good citizens. We want to be responsible, and we also want to have our own personal rights protected. So from an education point of view, this is going to take a collaboration from a lot of people, from the school boards, administration, in particular the IT personnel and the students. And we want to come together to create a community where people know what they're doing and we can equip the students with the skills they need to become active citizens of tomorrow. So there are lots of concerns around AI. And if you want to have a framework of how to think about these concerns, one great one is the Déclaration de Montréal y a responsable or the Montreal Declaration for Responsible AI. And they go through a whole bunch of the different risks. So a few of them I have on this uh, slide. We'll also talk about some of them in more detail later on. Um, there's a risk of discrimination. We have new systems that maybe haven't been tested and maybe they will discriminate against people. Um, we have privacy risks. AI systems need a lot of data, and often they try and get our personal data to use it. Um, we have selective exposure. So that's the idea that a lot of times AI systems are what's being used so that you only see certain things, which has implications. A vulnerable workforce, as with automation and other kinds of robotics beforehand, this may report or this may replace some jobs which in some cases may be good, in other cases may have negative consequences. Um, a lack of explainability is a big one. So that's that AI systems often don't, are pretty opaque. They don't actually show how they're making a decision or showing something. And finally, environmental risks, which is the fact that since these AI systems are so complex, they use a lot of computing power. So that's a lot of energy. That's also a lot of materials to make all the computers um, that are doing the calculations, which are the artificial intelligence. Often that's kind of off on a server somewhere. And we don't think about it very often, but that is still a concern. So that was my whirlwind tour very quickly through three different kind of categories or six different categories of risk that artificial intelligence has. As I go through the presentation, then we're going to um, talk in a bit more detail about some of these as they pertain to specific examples. But before we do that, I want you to have a hands-on experience with an AI system. So what we're going to do is play around with a system called QuickDraw. So I've used this a lot in different classrooms. I always have a fun time doing it. I will put the link in the chat. And I'll show you one round of this, and then you can kind of go through it by yourself. So this says, can a neural network learn to recognize Doodler? So a neural network is a specific kind of computer program that is often used in AI. Uh, it's one of the more powerful things in AI, so it's become very, very common. And let's see if it can recognize my doodles. So it's going to tell me something and I have to try and draw it. I see circle, or skateboard, or bow tie, or toothpaste. Oh, I know, it's megaphone. So with just a few lines, it was able to get it. So I want everyone to try like a round of this. There's six different things you draw during that round. 
And then, so we'll take a few months for that and then we'll come back and talk about it. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully everyone had a chance to try that out. So this is an example of a neural net that's looking at what you're drawing. So looking at the lines that you draw, it actually also looks at the order that you draw the lines in and um, is trying to identify it. So maybe you've used like speech to text before. That's a similar kind of thing, which also probably uses a neural network where it's listening to the sounds coming out and trying to assign it to a specific word. So saying these sounds sound like match the pattern of this particular word. Um, so speech to text is an example of a system much like this, which a lot of us use without really thinking about it. But the cool thing about this website, website, other than the fact that it's gamified and lots of kids like have fun just playing again and again on it, is that it actually shows you the data that the system was trained on. So for example, if I click on megaphone here, it will show you what other people drew from megaphone. So most people had a similar idea to me. A lot of people put some lines to indicate the sound. That would have been a good idea. And it also shows you what other things my drawing looked like. So it kind of looked like a tube of a toothpaste. Um, in this particular one, I didn't get anything wrong, which I was kind of surprised because it doesn't really look like a squirrel. Um, so it's also interesting when you get something wrong because it will show you the closest matches and you can see um, why uh, it thought it was something else. So for example, squirrel, you can see that most people had the same idea of a scroll for me. They just did a better job of drawing it. I didn't get very far before it answered. And um, we'll look at diamond as well. So I did get diamond, although some people thought, or it, the other closest words were ice cream or chair. So when we look at diamonds, a lot of people had the same idea as me, kind of drawing that classic shape, although a few people had drawn like a ring with a diamond on it, which is another way of doing it. So this is cool. So you can see a little bit about how the program is looking for patterns. If we go back to the main page, oh, I didn't want to play again. So go back to the main page, as well as seeing the data just for um, what you did specifically, 
You can also click here and see the data of all the different possible words. So if you look at this, these are all the different possible words that were the system was trained on. So those are the possible suggestions that you might get um, while you're playing the game. So you can see all sorts of words. There are about 300 of them, which seems like a lot until you realize like just how many words you use in a day. And then you get an idea how something like speech to text has to be even more complicated because it has to be able to recognize pretty much anything you say. So for example, if I click on squirrel here, I can see all the little drawings of squirrels. Um, you can see that kind of like it animates how it drew, because as I said before, the order that you drew the sequences in um, matches. So for this particular one, everyone um, drew basically the same thing. We have lots of bushy tails. Um, it's a little bit tricky to draw just as a doodle, so they're all slightly different. Um, but we can try something else. So for example, here's people drawing postcards. And this one was a baseball bat. So there's lots of options and they even share their data so you can do something with it yourself if you wanted to. So that is a cool interactive game that kids have a lot of fun um, doing and is a really cool way of kind of getting people to think about how data can be used to train a system and things like that. There are limitations to a system like this. Um, so an interesting one to look at is alarm clock. Um, a lot of people have drawn what's kind of like the old fashioned alarm clock that has like the bells on top of it, which is a bit weird because you think who actually has that anymore until you realize that that's kind of the symbol or the icon for alarm clock. So that's an example of how um, something like a doodle, it becomes more about the symbol of the thing than the actual thing. And another one that may be interesting is fan, if I can find that. I think they have that here. So there you can see that um, there are lots of people who drew kind of like a desk fan or a stand fan, but, but maybe if you drew like a fan that you hold in your hand, that wouldn't be recognized by the system. So these kinds of systems also have limitations like that. So that's quick draw. So going back to our slides, we want to talk a little bit about what's actually happening behind the surface here and define our terms for artificial intelligence. So if we talk about programming in a very general sense, there's two different approaches. Um, there's something programmatic which is give specific instructions to the machine on how to solve the pro program. So that would be something like um, if you see a circle and there's lines coming out of it, it's a sun. So if quick draw was done in a rule-based way, then someone would have had to write out definitions for each of those words and what they look like. And that would probably be pretty narrow. Um, the new approach called machine learning and what we're is kind of a more specific name for usually what we mean by AI is that you, instead of coding the computer on exactly what to do in every possible situation, you code the computer so it can learn. And then you give it a whole bunch of data that it learns from. And based on that um, learning process, it gets what's called a model. So a model is similar to kind of like a scientific model. So you might have an equation that describes some physical property. The model is like the computer's representation of how the world works, how the specific system it was trained on works. And then it can make classifications, make decisions based on that model. So just put that in a little diagram that's nice and simple. Um, we have some training data. So for quick draw, that was thousands of pictures that different people did on each of those 300 words. We have a mo uh, algorithmic process where um, the computer learns from that data and creates its model. 
And then finally, we can give um, the system a new drawing, which is what all of you did when you were playing along with it. And then it can put it in the right category. So that's our output. It's going to say, oh, I know, it's a cat. It put it in the cat category. Um, so that's why we like quick draw. It's a nice, cool, quick way of doing it. And this kind of three-step process for artificial intelligence is simplified, but it's a really useful way of thinking about it when we talk about a bunch of different um, examples of artificial intelligence. So you can always think training data, a model that learns from it, and then we get some kind of an output. As I mentioned a bit when I was going through the data, there are always biases. So for example, one of the words is shoe. And the example that they most likely got was this kind of a shoe, but maybe they don't see many high heeled shoes. So that's an example of um, the, the um, data may be biased away from one type of shoes and that will have a hard time uh, recognizing uh, a specific type of shoes. So if we're playing the quick draw game, that's kind of a trivial thing, doesn't make much difference. But if you have AI systems that are making more important, decisions, like who gets, yeah, like who gets um, a loan, for example, um, or which resumes are um, accepted for a job application, then that risk of discrimination is much more severe. So that's our introduction on kind of what artificial intelligence is. And we want to think about this process whenever we're thinking about a new artificial intelligence system. The other thing that's really interesting about these artificial intelligence systems when they're put into practice is that they can be self-reinforcing. So we talked about um, the quick draw example. For that particular one, they got a set of drawings, they trained it, and that model is now staying the same for whoever else plays the game. But things like social media or YouTube or Netflix that suggest new things for you to watch or read or look at are also using a very similar thing. They're taking all the data of what you click on, what you watch, what you interact with, how long you look at something, and they're putting that into an algorithm to determine what you would probably like most next. And the interesting thing about that is that it becomes a loop. So when it feeds you something it thinks you like, it gets immediate feedback on um, whether you like it or not, whether you click on it. And that goes back into the data and that will go back into the algorithm and that will improve the result. So I don't know if anyone here has um, explored TikTok, but that was one where I found the first 20 minutes that I was on it, I was just like, I don't understand why anyone likes this because it was just very generic things, things that didn't really interest me. But fairly quickly, it got into some very specific things. Um, like it started um, showing me like cooking videos that I really liked. It also started showing me videos of people who used to be part of cults and religious backgrounds and were talking about their experiences, which is a particular interest of mine. So you can see that these systems can be very powerful because of this loop, and that can have a big impact on how we interact with them. Another important idea when we're thinking about the question of why is AI like suddenly a big thing, and it's because of the data. So I explained that process of data and learning and an output. If you have a little bit of data, that system will be very powerful. If you have more, the more data you have, the more accurate your predictions will be and the more like precise your predictions can be. So really what's um, made things like ChatGPT uh, be possible these days is because we actually have the hardware and the infrastructure to deal with all the data. So it was also developments in the algorithms that learn from the data, but a big part of it is just having enough technology to support all this data. Also being able to collect data through the internet from various people all around the world. So the continued increase in just data that's available out there is one of the things that has led to the increase in AI. This of course comes with some of the risks I talked about earlier. So if we're talking about um, more hardware 
to store all this data and to analyze all this data that comes with environmental risks. And if we're talking about data about people, that comes from privacy risk risks. And that's a very interesting question because a lot of the times, for example, if you put a picture up on Facebook, that can be a picture that you wanted to share with your friends and you're fine with that. But you might not realize um, that that picture could then be used to train an AI recognition model later on. And that is a big problem that we need to talk about. The next thing I want to talk about is different types of AI systems. So I'm going to be very general here and kind of divide it up into two. So we have the systems that we talked about so far, which um, were something like QuickDraw. QuickDraw takes a drawing and says it's this. Basically, what it's doing is classification. It's saying, I have a bunch of words, and I'm going to stick your doodle into one of these categories from one of these words. Um, that can also be thought of, of analysis. You're analyzing something and deciding what it is. And it can also be thought of as prediction because you can put, you can divide something into categories of like things that I would like to click on on Facebook and things that I wouldn't like on Facebook. So um, if it's classifications based on what we think will happen next, and that's an example of prediction. But that's all dealing with things that were already existing. A really new type of AI, which is changing things a lot, is generation. So generative AI is AI that makes something new. The biggest example of this is ChatGPT, which generates new text, which is very interesting. But there are also systems that can generate new sounds and systems that can generate new images. So I wanted to talk a little bit in specific about an example of what can happen with generative AI uh, when we're talking about images. And so this is about a platform called Midjourney, which um, is something that get a platform which can create new images. Maybe you've heard of DAL-E. This is a similar platform like this. So like all the image generating systems, what you do is you write a prompt. So that's a description of what you want to see. Sometimes it will have something like a style in it. Um, and then it will generate an image for you. Actually, usually it will generate several images for you because there's a little bit of randomness in the system. And then you can choose what you want. So this is a really cool thing. And I actually have some personal experience with this because we were running a program called the Lunar Gateway Challenge, where we were trying to get um, students from across Canada to think about space ex exploration and design their own lunar rovers. So we had all their submissions up on our website, which they're still there. So if you want to go check them out, it's really cool. Um, and someone on our team had the idea that we could take the descriptions the students had and feed them into um, mid-journey to create this AI rendering of what their designs looked like. So this was really cool because the, um, the descriptions were interesting and we were doing something that kids had dreamt up but hadn't actually designed. So it's really something new. Um, and we had this on our website for a while, but after that, there was other people at our company who brought out some concerns. And that was basically that there has been a major backlash in artistic communities against software like Midjourney and other AI image generation sites, basically because when all these programs were being made, they had to be trained on data. They had to get their data from somewhere. And basically what happened is a lot of the companies developing the software just scraped data from the internet. So artists had put out their images on the internet because they wanted to share them. Maybe they were part of a storefront where they were selling their art. And they didn't predict that um, training for an AI system was even something that was possible until it already existed, until their data had already been taken and it was used to generate new art. So, um, this was interesting to hear about, and it really underlined for me that I had gotten caught up when we were building our website on, oh, this kind of AI imaging looks cool. 
we might as well put it in. It seems trivial. It seems like it won't work. And I didn't do what I always tell my students to do when I'm doing workshops, which is actually think about how the system is working and also think about where the data is coming from. So when you think about where the data is coming from, if they're generating new images, they must have been trained on lots of um, images from somewhere. It's most likely that they got that from the internet. If they're able to generate images in different styles of different artists, then they probably took the art from um, those artists. And it's an interesting question because in some ways it's not very different from um, drawing your own new image. So any artist who's drawing their own image is being influenced by all the art that they've ever seen. But um, when we're talking about an AI system, it's not like they're understanding what they see in the art and making their own interpretation. It really is more kind of like mashing it together. And there are definitely um, examples of where the um, AI image generation seems to be more like a copy paste kind of a situation than in actually creating something new. So uh, definitely a big reminder that whenever you're thinking about a new AI system, you want to um, really consider where the data came from and consider how it could be impacting other people. So um, I'm going to skip a few of my slides because I want to talk about another of the big generative AI systems, and that is ChatGPT. So I'm sure everyone has heard about ChatGPT before. Um, maybe people could put in the chat whether they've actually used ChatGPT before. <clears throat> okay, some people have tried it out. Some people tried it to make a workout plan. That's interesting. Some people haven't used it yet. Okay. So ChatGPT, um, it's a really cool program to use. It feels very much like you're talking to someone else. Um, we're very used to these days talking to people through text. Um, so whether you're texting on your phone or sending emails back and forth or using Messenger or WhatsApp or all a bunch of different apps. So it feels very much like talking to someone else. Um, <clears throat> what you can do with it is very open because it can generate text. All it's trained to do is generate text. So it can generate text on almost anything. Uh, to quote what they how they describe it is ChatGPT is fine tuned from GPT 3.5, a language model trained to do, produce text. ChatGPT was optimized for dialogue by using reinforcement learning with human feedback, a method that uses humans demonstrations and preference comparisons to guide the model towards desired behavior. So that part is also important. Um, we talked about the idea of a model earlier when we were going through how QuickDraw works. So that is the computer's, um, I would like to say understanding, although that kind of implies a bit too much thinking on the computer's part um, of how things work. And then on top of that, there was this other level, which is the reinforcement learning. What that basically is, is that ChatGPT would generate a couple of different possible answers. And then there would be a human sitting at a computer which would say, this is the best one. Um, so that was one way that they were able to create ChatGPT, which was trained on the internet, um, which there's a lot of things on the internet which aren't appropriate for a general audience. So this was one way that they were able to kind of filter out some of that and um, make some topics be um, like not acceptable. Um, and it's interesting to know how they did this is that it was actually contractors in Africa um, paid um, what would be a small wage by Western standards because it took just a lot of hours of people going through lots of different suggestions um, to actually get the desired output. 
Uh, it's useful to know who makes ChatGPT. That is an organization called OpenAI, which is an AI research company. And their mission is to ensure that artificial general intelligence benefits all of humanity. So artificial general intelligence is something that's more than a chat bot. It's kind of like the intelligence that would be similar to a human can do all the tasks that a human can do. Um, so that's their big goal. Um, nice that they have benefits all of humanity in their mission. But if you've been listening to the news, you may have heard about how there's been internal struggle over exactly what that means and who has the best interest at heart. So it's always hard to know exactly how to do that. And it is free to use. So um, there is um, the newer model. So the more up-to-date model, which has more up-to-date training data is paid, but the free to use model is very powerful. So I alluded to um, a couple of things that can um, use artificial intelligence systems earlier, such as face the Facebook algorithm, the TikTok algorithm. Those are interesting because they're very hidden and they, uh, they affect a lot of what we see online, but we aren't always thinking about, oh yes, this is an AI system I'm talking to. The interesting thing about ChatGPT is that it's very upfront with that. It's also very upfront with its limitations. So when you um, see the first screen, it will tell you some examples, it will tell you what it can do, and it will also tell you what it can't do. So its limitations are that it can generate incorrect information, it can um, possibly produce harmful instructions or biased content, and it only was trained up to 2021. So those are some of the limitations. Despite this, it is very powerful. So um, it can do a whole bunch of things um, that could be useful for teachers. So for example, um, drafting emails. Um, I've tried it when I was doing math tutoring to provide math problems. What I found it was good at is if you provided one math problem, it was, e it was very good at like providing the same kind of a problem, but with different words and different numbers. Uh, which was good for me because I have absolutely no imagination. So trying to figure out like a different way to word it and say a similar problem was good, uh, was useful, but it didn't really, I tried to get it to do like slightly harder problems and that seemed to be a limitation. It can be very good at kind of just idea generation. So asking it for writing prompts, asking for it for ideas, and you don't always have to use it as a system where um, like uh, you use it to create the text. You can also use it to create text and then use that as a starting point for um, the student's critiques. Um, and uh, another thing that can be very good is that a lot of us, me included, struggle with like starting a writing project. So using ChatGPT can be one way to get a bunch of words. I know usually when I use it, I like see, oh, I don't want to say it like that. And then I start editing it. And then I can create a document that's like mostly my words, but it just helps me get started. Uh, so finally, the last thing that's really important to highlight here is that um, it ChatGPT can be great at making things that look like citations. Um, there's a great example that was a lawyer who used ChatGPT to write a legal brief. And legal briefs always have citations to other legal cases. And it made them, and it had the formatting down, but it was referring to cases that didn't actually exist. So it had the right kind of sequence of numbers, but the numbers didn't make sense to what they were referring to. And that is a good reminder of what ChatGPT is actually doing. So it's a model to create text. Um, which means that it's doing calculations for each word it writes, saying what is the most likely word to go next? What word has the most, the highest probability to go next? And those probabilities are based on all the training of all the texts that it had before. So it's very good at making things that are grammatically correct, that make sense, but it doesn't necessarily have a deeper understanding of what's actually going on. And so it may lead you astray. And of course, some things can be grammatically correct 
um, but refer to false information be what's called hallucinations. Another example of the limitations is once I was using ChatGPT to write a description of a workshop I was doing, and it had to be under 500 words. So I asked it to write something under 500 words. That is something that ChatGPT is good at doing, which is like doing things within limitations. And then I asked it for a word count, uh, like how many words were in that paragraph. And it said there were 500 and, or there were 480 words in this paragraph. And then I copied it to a different software and I did a word count and that wasn't correct. It was a different answer. So this is a good reminder that all ChatGPT is doing is creating um, text. So it knew what the answer to that question should look like, that there should be a number at one point, and that number should be less than 500, because that was what I asked for. But it didn't actually do the calculation of looking through the words. That's actually a great other example of how ChatGPT in some ways makes a lot of human mistakes and is different from other computer programs. So um, a computer program, like counting words in a document is actually something that a computer is really good to do. It's something that's very easy to do using the rule-based programming that I described at the start of the workshop, um, but it's not something that uh, something like ChatGPT can do well because it wasn't programmed to do that. So that's just a good reminder of the limitations of ChatGPT and how it is a new tool. It's a tool that's very good for something that up till now computers weren't very good at generating text. So that makes it seem very powerful, but it is still limited. Um, <laughs> in a way, it's like a child. Yes, that's one way of thinking of it. Um, and as with anything, it's only good for what it was trained on and it's only good for the task that it was trained on. Uh, I did want to explain a little bit or explore a little bit of how you could use um, ChatGPT in your classroom. Um, one thing to remember is that it this will depend on your students, and I think there is a age limitation, um, so it wouldn't be appropriate to use in an elementary school classroom. Um, but as an example, I wanted to share with you this case of how AI is being used in a university classroom. So there's link there, a talk by Ethan and Lilac Mollick from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. So this is a, like advanced university stuff, very different from uh, elementary or even high school, but I think it's an interesting um, example and an interesting thing to discuss. So they had policies for AI use in their syllabus. So they have a policy upfront of, this is what the plan is. This is how we're going to use things. And they said, not don't ever use ChatGPT or ChatGPT is plagiarism or cheating. They said, I expect you to use AI in this class. So they're coming at really from the perspective that um, this is a tool. It's a tool that can make some things much faster. So it's definitely something that we want our students to be able to use. But it's not a free for all. There are some restrictions. Um, so first of all, you should know that if you provide minimum effort prompts, you'll get low quality results. Like any other tool, this is something that you have to know how to use. And for ChatGPT, what that usually means is um, the first question you ask it won't get you exactly what you want. Usually you have to go back and forth a few times. And that's, again, interesting because it's set up like a conversation. So you can, um, that feels very natural in some ways. So this isn't a case of you can do all your assignments just by copying and pasting the assignment into ChatGPT. You should actually think about what it's doing and try and make the results better. Second point is don't trust anything it says. I've talked about this previously. Um, it's definitely a danger of ChatGPT that because the sentences make sense, they may sound very authoritative and especially if you're not an expert in the subject, it might sound reasonable, so you might go with it. So it is good at generating text, but it's not good at um, being a fact checker. That is a step that you have to do separately. And finally, AI is a tool, but one that you need to acknowledge using. So we don't want to mislead people about where this writing came from. Um, 
And it's good for everyone if people know how, how different pieces of writing were created and what tools were being used. So that's one example of how um, AI could be used in a classroom. I do think this is an interesting take from someone who's dealing with older students, students who could probably um, see the output of ChatGPT and then have thoughts on how to improve it. If you're dealing with younger students who don't have as much experience writing, who might look at the output from ChatGPT and just be like, uh, looks fine to me, or I don't think I can do better than that. Um, that's a different case. So we want to be sure that younger students are still practicing their writing. So what I would say is that comes down to engaging your students and making sure that they know why we're actually um, assigning particular assignments, what they're supposed to be learning from it, and then that hopefully will illuminate why they're going through that process and what's helpful. So that was uh, my presentation going through um, uh, the Quick Draw as an example of an interactive AI system that you can use. We talked about some of the various risks from AI. Um, I talked in detail about the two different um, kinds of generative AI, um, image generation with the example from Midjourney, and then we talked about ChatGPT, both how it looks and how it works, and one example of a policy that you could use for it. So um, we do have quite a bit of time left, and I'm definitely happy to stay around for discussion of anything. And I already see a comment in the chat, which is excellent. I will say one thing before I get to that, which is the end of my slides have a bunch of resources. Um, we have lesson plans you can use with your classroom. Um, there are more teacher training opportunities like this and some of our other plans. Um, and we also have a survey. So if you can fill out that survey, that is very useful for us. Um, so I will get the link for the survey in just a second. And I also link the Montreal Declaration for Responsible AI. So that can give you a more in-depth view of all this. There is also the Di Guide for Deliberation, which is a little bit more about layman's one. Um, and yes. Uh, Susan, do you mind if I jump in really quickly? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm just going to take this opportunity to say thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Um, at this point, so everybody knows, I'm going to turn off the recording, uh, but we'll go back to the uh, the answering of questions. I'm sure there's a few. Um, thank you for joining us. And once again, uh, Susan, thank you so much for, I, I learned a lot. This was great. Thank you. You're welcome.